Let's ask God for help. Lord, as we come before your word, it would be easy to be entertained by learning new ideas. Or it would be easy to be bored because we don't care. Neither of those are why we're here, why I'm here. We want to see Jesus. We want to live lives that are corrected, rebuked, and encouraged. Because your spirit has caused us to stand before you in joy and awe. And I pray you would, despite my best and worst efforts, reveal Jesus, change your lives, let us delight in you more. I ask this in his name. Amen. Everybody here knows already that some philosophers and some physicists claim that God is dead. They killed him. Uh, in the 1850s, a philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche announced that God is dead. Many other like-minded philosophers joined into that chorus with Nietzsche. They killed God by their philosophy. And joyfully for them, God is no longer a worry. And then in the 2000s, the new atheists, Dawkins, Harris, Dennett, Hitchens, announced that physics also had killed God. They confidently declared they have no need of that hypothesis, God. For them, physics stood, well, on physics. There's no need, they say, for God outside of the universe. The universe is all there is and all there ever will be. The God hypothesis, they said, is Dead with confidence. But recently, Stephen Meyer wrote a book called The God Hypothesis in which he announces to these same physicists, to these same philosophers, to all the world who thinks maybe they should follow them, that in fact the God Hypothesis stands. In truth, all this fuss about God, that is pretending he doesn't exist, is not new. Since the beginning of time, many have thought they could and must and should do without God. To them, God is dead. But to such people, the universe declares that is the furthest thing from the truth. I want to begin this morning by reading from Psalm 48. If you're fast, you can turn there. But you will do well to just let it wash over you. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. A beautiful elevation is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. And as soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight, trembling. They took hold there, or trembling took hold of them as anguish, as of a woman in labor. God is alive, and all the universe declares, and God himself says, I am God, your God whom you thought was dead. Those who pretend otherwise will yet one day meet him. Now you probably think I wasn't paying attention to the text for this morning when it was read. I used old notes. But this is the same thing that we are going to be confronted with here today. Our text in Genesis 45 is part of this very same discussion about God. Yes, the text, which you heard read by Sam this morning. It is true history and it matters as history. It happened in Egypt on a particular date. But it is also a pointer to the greater story. 
and it is participating in that greater story. And it's both that I want us to see here today. Joseph's whose brothers thought they had killed him. Joseph now offers them a shock. I am Joseph. Now think about it. The very author who wrote these words, spoken by Joseph, in just a few chapters will introduce us to the God who says, I am that I am. Joseph is essentially saying, you thought you killed me, but I'm alive. Yes, Joseph has been rather irritating. He was a younger brother. He had those dreams. He had that amazing technicolor dream coat. And, well, there's his attitude. Joseph seemed to think he was daddy's favorite. And so he had, was in charge of them. No, he was. And so one day, when the brothers had had enough, they made plans to finish him off. They were going to kill him. At the last minute, they changed their mind. And choosing what was a fate essentially worse than death, they sold him into slavery. Now, after more than 20 years, they were quite confident Joseph is dead. But then a famine hit the land. They found themselves going to Egypt multiple times to buy grain that they might not starve. It was a bit more complicated than that, but we've been through that history. You know that story. Now today in chapter 45, their brother, the one they thought they had killed, the one they thought was dead. He is alive and he reigns supreme in Egypt and they're standing before him with no cover. He is their supreme ruler. Now they're in his court. Now his life, their lives or death is in his hands. This is a story that we'll examine this morning. And this is the one that I will compare because I think God does. Their relationship with Joseph, my, your relationship with Jesus Christ. For Christians, how do you listen? If you're a Christian this morning, this is doubly good news. The old new good news that as a Christian you already know is that Jesus died for you and he is your savior. The new good news that I hope confronts us this morning is that he's delighted with you. If you are not yet a Christian this morning, here's how to listen. I want you to discover now that Jesus is alive. I want you to discover now that he is for you. And I want you to hear from this text what you need to do now to get ready to meet him. God, who is rumored to have been killed, is alive and reigning supreme over us. He lives for us. He calls us to come to him. And amazingly, he overflows with joy that you come before him. That's the story. The one we tried to kill. That's who he is. So four ideas. Here's the first. God sent me before you. Jesus was sent to rescue us. This story is filled with passion and compassion. And surprise. And the surprise that we've already talked about this morning, I am Joseph, as Bruce told us last week, is not a trivial surprise. It's not as if Joseph was saving this up to play a trick on his brothers. Now, his dad was a trickster. Jacob, who lived his life by tricking Esau, tricking his father, tricking his father-in-law, and were it possible, he tried to trick God. Remember that bit about laying out the peeled sticks in front of the flocks so that they would bring more speckled and spotted. 
But that's not Joseph. He is no trickster like his dad. So why did he wait so long? The very question that Bruce asked last week. The very reason that Sam read the first few verses of last week's text. This revelation has been on hold since, well, by the chapters, chapter 42. It's been on hold for 18 months, if you will, since they first showed up in Joseph's kingdom asking for food. It even had the cost to them of Simeon's imprisonment for much of that time. Why wait? Why wait? Well, you saw this in the text. In verse 42, I just want to make sure you understand the basis of what we're saying in 45. Verse 32 says, if your servant, of 44, if your servant became a pledge for safety for the boy, to my father saying, if I do not bring him back to you, I shall bear the blame before my father for his life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain. This, this is Judah talking. He hadn't done anything wrong. Please let your servant remain instead of the boy who is servant to my Lord, let the boy go back with his brothers. Judah, the ancestor of Jesus, guiltless, is offering himself as a substitute. What does that mean? To Joseph it meant he had given them time to repent and to test that repentance. And it was genuine. On the basis of that, we turn to this chapter but in the basis of that, I would say God also waited. Can I read to you from Romans 3? This delay was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of who? The one who has faith. Which is revealed, my parenthetical addition, which is revealed in Romans 3 by repentance. So like God, Joseph is no trickster. Like God, Joseph has no foolish glee at waiting to reveal. Jesus didn't wait to come for 2,000 or more years just to make a grand entrance. No, it was for us. It was for God's nature and glory and passion for us. That the world would see who God is, be confronted by our sin. And now, having waited exactly the right amount of time, we see in chapter 45, Joseph could not control himself any longer. Before all those who stood before him, he sent them all out and he made himself known. I am Joseph, whom you thought you killed. These are interesting words and not what any of us would expect. I wouldn't expect Joseph to not control himself. I would not have expect, expected Joseph to weep aloud before Pharaoh and the whole household. Such words are not playfulness, not of a trickster, but of one who has deep groaning compassion for these brothers. This was not, I guess I'll tell them who I am. After all, I've made them wait long enough. This will surprise them. No. Joseph was deeply moved out of love for these brothers who tried to kill him. And when they heard, they all celebrated. No. They were dismayed at his presence. For though they had repented, all they could see, all they could feel, was their sin against him. This is not unlike the physicists and philosophers 
who will face this same Jesus that they thought they killed. And it is not unlike you and I, every one of us here, deeply sinful, who has failed God at more levels in the last week than we're even aware of. And then there's the ones we are. And Jesus will say, I am Jesus, the one you crucified. What then? Revelation looks forward to this day. And here's how the book of Revelation, John in chapter 1 writes. It says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn. This is not weeping. Will mourn because of him. You see why? I am Joseph. I am Jesus. What a shock. What a terror. Until those next words so odd come out of his mouth. Come near to me please. Come near to me, please. Not bring the guard. And they came near. Now, this isn't just good news yet. John's gospel, chapter 5, says this, Jesus speaking. The Father has given the Son authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. An hour is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear his voice, my parenthesis, come near. And parenthesis, and they will come out, and those who have done good to resurrection, but those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Come near isn't yet necessarily good news. But the second shock after we get over this first, he says, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. I am Jesus, whom you crucified. And now, hear this like you've never heard it before. You have. Can you hear it for the first time again? Do not be distressed or angry. With yourselves, because you sold me here. Really? Here's why. Here's why Joseph said this. Here's why Jesus says this. God sent me before you to preserve life. Wow. I actually had that written in the text. Wow. What a way for Joseph to look at this. What a way for Jesus to look at this. Who is this guy, Joseph, that he could think like this? Why is he not at least a little angry? Well, maybe he was, but he resolved it before this moment. He resolved it before this moment because he has absolute confidence in the God who rules over heaven and earth. And what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Good Friday. Really? Good Friday? This is quite amazing. Oh, how much the story of Jesus requires, sorry, the story of Joseph requires that we see Jesus and understand that story. Or this would have no context. How stunning it is, count with me, five times, that's how important this is, Joseph says, God sent me before you. Would you look in your text? Verse 5. God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant. And verse 8. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. You know that rule? The Bible says something once, you better do it. You better listen up. If it says it twice, if it says it three times, there's really intentionality here. This is not just a casual the author needed more words to fill the page. Joseph said it three times because it was that important, hard to take in, and necessary that we do. No small point. 
for Joseph, for Moses the author, or for God the author of salvation. Second point, come near me. Jesus draws us to himself for life. So three times, Joseph repeated that God had sent him before them to preserve them. Now, three times, Joseph will invite, command his brothers, come near me. We've looked at that initially, but let's look even closer. Verses 9 and 10. Hurry. Go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You, your children, your children's children and flocks and herds and all that you have. And we heard this earlier in verse 4, come near me. We're not sure where that was going at first. Could have been for judgment. Could have been for joy. It was for joy. We see it repeated here again in 9 and 10. That again, he's saying, for joy, come near me and know the joy of being with me. Not just now, but forever. Did you catch that? Your children and your children's children. Now, God had already told Moses back in chapter 15 of Moses. Everybody's Moses, Abraham, Noah. God had told Abraham back in chapter 15 that this is going to be for 400 years. This isn't forever. But it looks forward to that time that is. Jesus is saying, come near me. You and your children's children and be with me forever. That's what we're beginning to hear. But I want you to see there is a third time. These words come to me out of the mouth of Joseph are now put in the mouth of Pharaoh in verse 18. Look, take your father, your household goods, and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land. Do you remember Joseph's dream? The specific dreams back in chapter 37? Many dreams in Genesis. But these dreams are the ones that are now 20, 22 years old. Maybe longer. Joseph dreamed that all his brothers, like sheaves of wheat, would be bowing down before him. Then he said, not just his brothers, but his brothers, mother and father, as sun, moon, and all the stars would bow down before him. Now this has come about. Joseph's brothers have bowed and on several occasions. And now even his father was being told, come down and bow down. So the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams is draw near. Surrender is a good thing to the one who's worthy of our surrender. And amazingly, he's offering us love. Come near to me and let me provide you with an abundance. But it's not a mere invitation, is it? When it comes from the reigning throne of Egypt, it is an absolute command and it can't be disobeyed. When Jesus speaks to you and says, come to me, you will respond. Pray that he will, if he hasn't yet. And why are we to come near? Again, from the Gospel of John. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. But whoever does not honor the Son, hmm, does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly I say to you that whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and he does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So either he's our judge or he's our Savior. Which is it today for you? Savior. Savior. May it be so. For everyone that is hearing God's voice in mine. Jesus said it this way. Come near to me, Matthew 11. All you who labor and are heavy laden. For I would give you rest when you come near. For my burden is light and my yoke is rightly fitted. You'll find rest for your souls with me. What is this promise? 
In coming, you will dwell in the land of Goshen. There used to be something called a hymn, uh, which had that refrain in it. You know, here's what's interesting about the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen is not an Eden. It's in Egypt. They're going to make garden wherever they go because wherever God is, he commissions us to be the gardeners who make garden with him. He's calling us right wherever you are to be with him eternally, starting now though, starting now. The Hebrew word for this garden of Goshen is the word tov. You know that word, masel tov, masel tov. It's the same word that Moses and God used in Genesis 1. And everything God made was very good, very tov. Now, here in this text, in verse 16, it says, It was good to Pharaoh, tov, to say to the servants, come down. And what's he going to give them? Verse 20, the tov of all the land, the good of the land. And verse 23, they were loaded with the good things of the land of Egypt. God is inviting you to be with him today to make your wilderness life an Eden with him and to invite you ultimately to come and be with him in heaven. Because when the family of Joseph moved down to Egypt, as we'll see next week, they're moving down to die, basically. Death comes quickly now for the father and soon for Joseph. The number of chapters is shortening and shortening. You were invited to come and die in Christ and have the good of the land with him now and forever. Last triplet. First triplet, God sent me ahead of you. Second triplet, come and be with me. Third triplet, amazingly, I rejoice over you. Jesus' overflowing joy to have you with him. I, I didn't say to have him with you. That's true. Jesus' overflowing joy to have you with him. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, and he wept aloud. Look at verse 14. 14 says, then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Verse 15, and then he kissed all his brothers and he wept upon them. And his brothers talked with him. This is amazing to me. I struggle to believe this. Will you enter into that struggle with me? Maybe it's because I was brought up Baptist. I don't know. Uh, uh, but it, it's hard. I see my sin. That it, it's not hard to convince me of my sin. I believe in repentance. I know that on Christ I will be brought into heaven. Do you have a, a picture in your mind's eye that when you get to heaven, God says, yes, come in. All right. And you kind of, you know, hide your eyes. and you... Yeah, you're forgiven. But I hope, as it should be, your sin is so big to you that you take it that seriously. And yet, what do we sing? His love is greater. Does that really land? That's what I want to ask in this third triplet. As Joseph's story was real, and these verses in verse 1 and 14 and 15 act as a picture frame for the key action in this story and the central idea, 1 to 15, is the central piece. And this shows it by this Framing of weeping. And Joseph is overwhelmingly delighted that they are with him. Not just that they have him.
God will welcome you into his heaven that way based on Jesus' work and his gift to you of repentance. I think this is the only idea that I want you to take away in a week or in a month or in five years from this text from this morning. There's more to learn. There's so much in this text. But can we get this? Notice again that Joseph's joy is undisguised from all the public. Oh, yeah, he says, send them out. He did. I want to be alone with my brothers. That was more about wanting to be alone with his brothers. He wasn't masking it so that nobody else knew. This is a public, overwhelming, unkingly display. I mean, we know that right from the prodigal son and the father running to his son is just wrong in Eastern culture. And this has that same flavor. Public weeping, public joy, public falling apart. Second, his overflowing joy is first in his full brother Benjamin. There's a lot to talk about there, about Israel and the church. Another day, Nick will cover that, or Bruce. Third, it says he kissed each of his brothers. That kiss says there's nothing between us. And he wept on each one of them. Not like over all of them, on each of them it sounds like. Again, I, I wonder if we believe this. Luke 15. I tell you there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Zechariah chapter 3, Zephaniah chapter 3, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. We believe that. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. And he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. There's a wonderful idea. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. Think of Revelation. Where Jesus says of us, he will not be, well, Hebrews and Revelation, he will not be ashamed to call his brothers. He will declare our name before the Father and his angels. Imagine this. You die. And you are ushered into heaven, a sinner repentant. You are welcomed by God when you arrive in his presence. And Jesus wraps his arms around you and weeps on your neck and covers you with kisses. That is very hard for me to wholly feel. Maybe some of you are better at this. But that's what I want us to take away today. The reality of that. The last idea, and it'll be brief. We will provide for you. We touched on that slightly, but I want you to see that these three ideas, God sent me ahead of you, Come near to me. I will rejoice over you and smother you with kisses. What will eternity be like then when it starts? Again, sh- longest part of the text, shortest bit of the sermon. We only have so much time. But I want you to see first that this is not Jesus talking the Father into doing something. I want you to see here, look at verses 16 to 18. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph and his brothers had come. It was Tov to Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say this to your brothers. Load your beast, go back to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the Tov of the land. In store for you is the Tov of the land. 
And if we follow particularly John into the New Testament, we'll see that the tove of the land, the good of the land, the good land, it's Jesus himself. And your eternity is with the one who wants to pour out good on you. And how do I know? Why do I make the claim this is like eternity? Watch what this text does. Again, only briefly. Look at uh, verse 18. It says, and take your father and your households. Come to me. I'll give you the best of the land and you shall eat the fat of the land. <clears throat> in eternity, we will eat in celebration with our God. We recall the garden trees at the opening story and we anticipate the wedding feast of the Lamb. Look at two. We will enjoy the good creation of God. This is in verse 20. Heaven or have no concern for your goods. For again, the best of the land in Egypt is yours. Not just eating, but all that goes with being in the good land. This is the case again for the garden. And it is also the case for the new heavens and the new earth. The new house that God is even now preparing for you. And third, he will give us new clothes to wear. Look at verse 22. And to each and all of them he gave a change of clothes. But to Benjamin, my interpolation, of course, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. And it goes on. But in this he will give us new clothes to wear. And we recall the clothes of the garden, the poor clothes that didn't cover their nakedness. And then God gave them skins of animals. But in heaven, not skins of animals, white clothes to wear, clothes that have been made white in the blood of our Savior. This is speaking of eternity. This is prophetic speaking. God's provision for us in eternity. It was a wonderful shock to find that the one we killed wants us with him. How can you have this wonderful reality? That too, they answered that question is in this text. Verse 25, so they went up to Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive. He's ruler of the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart became numb. He did not believe. As long as his heart was numb and he did not believe, he not only wasn't going up, but he wasn't gaining all these benefits. What changed? For he did not believe them. Verse 27. But when they told him all the words of Jesus, yeah, I changed that word on purpose, which he had said to them. And when they saw all the provisions that Jesus was giving Israel said, Jacob said, it is enough. Jesus is enough for us. Lord, call us in faith to see, know, and delight in you now. That we might experience the day when you fall on us, how can this be? with kisses and weeping for your joy?